listening to one of you and thanks for having made the series today. Well, as a way to start things, I'm a political scientist. <laughs> well, you might think what you want of that, but I'm not a geologist. And according to many geologists today, we have entered a new era in the history of the planet. And this era is called the Anthropocene, which means literally the age of humans. So according to them, we've now exceeded the Holocene, in which we've been for the last 15,000 years or so, and we've entered the Anthropocene, which is this new age in the history of the planet. And the reason why we've moved from the Holocene to the Anthropocene is because, according to them, humans are now bigger forces of transformation of the planet than the planet itself. The main agents of transformation of the planet, that is now us. This is a little bit flabbergasting, not just because we change from one geological era to another every 15 to 20,000 years, but also because if the Anthropocene is the age of humans, we can only gather that the period that will come after the Anthropocene, <laughs> well, we won't be there anymore. <laughs> well, of course, the good thing is that every geological period lasts about 15 to 20,000 years. This gives us plenty of time to have kids and grandchildren for those of you who are so inclined. But it has a deep, political meaning, and that's the reason why I'm interested in it as a political scientist. Because we used to think that the Earth and the world were two separate things, two separate entities. That the, that the Earth was about the physics and chemistry and biology, whereas the world was the social and political organization of the Earth. And the world was about politics and economics and sociology. It was about social sciences, basically, whereas the Earth was all about natural sciences. In the Anthropocene, it is no longer possible to make that distinction. In the Anthropocene, we need to consider that the Earth and the world actually make up just one big entity. And I think that one of the reasons why we are now in this deep environmental crisis is because we've always considered in the past that the world and the Earth were two different things and that the Earth was just a kind of background, was an object of politics, but not a subject of politics. And what the Anthropocene tells us, from a political science viewpoint, is that the Earth has now become a subject of politics. We are at this time when the history of the Earth and the history of humans basically collide with each other. I'm sure that you all know the story that if one could condense the history of the Earth in a day of 24 hours, the Homo sapiens would appear at the 23rd hour and 58 minutes or something like that. We are at this precise moment when the two histories collide. At this moment, we call it the Anthropocene. And of course, one of the key markers of the Anthropocene is climate change. First, I'd like you to take a few moments to look at this picture. It is an actual ad published in 1962 in a major American magazine, Life magazine. That's an ad for an oil company called Humble. And in this ad, Humble boasts that they can supply enough energy every day to melt seven million tons of glacier. <laughs> what a fantastic joke. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> one of the very few ads in the history of advertisement that were not deceptive. <laughs> they did it. Well done, Humber. It's quite remarkable because it tells us that in 1962, it was absolutely okay to make jokes about that. We 
did not really know about climate change. Well, scientists knew, but politicians and the population didn't know for real. So it could be a matter of joke. No, it is. Climate change is not so fun anymore. The year 2014 broke all records of warming and became the warmest year in history since the invention of the thermometer. That record was broken by the year 2015, which became the hottest year on record. The record of 2015 was broken in 2016. 2017 did almost as well, but tied with the year 2015. The reason why we're experiencing right now the very first impacts of climate change is because of this ad in 1962. One of the facts about climate change that is little known to the public is that it takes about two generations for the greenhouse gas emissions that we're sending in the atmosphere to translate into climate impacts. Meaning that the impacts that we're experiencing now are not the result of our own emissions, but are the result of the emissions of our parents and grandparents who lived in the 1960s. And that the consequences of the emissions that we're producing today, right now, at this very moment, will be felt by our grandchildren in about 50 years from now. That's not a very strong incentive to act if you consider that given that our greenhouse gas emissions have continuously increased in the past 50 years and will continue to increase for quite a few years, that means that the situation will go from bad to worse in the next 50 years. Even if we start acting today, which we are not even doing, even if we were to start acting today and to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions today, we could expect to see some consequences of that in about 2068. I'll be dead by then, and some of you will as well. That's not a mega incentive to act. Especially if you're a politician in a democracy. The problem of democracies is that your mandate is pretty limited in time. You cannot stay in power for 60 or 70 years. If you're in a democracy, you'll stay in power for four or five years. You'll double that duration if you're lucky. But basically, you cannot expect to show your voters an actual materialization of what you have done on climate change during your mandate. And this is one of the key difficulties in acting on climate change. Yet there is an obvious urgency to act. If you look at these, all temperature anomalies are in color. The anomalies that are lower than what the temperature should have been are in blue. The temperatures that are higher than what, sh than what they should have been are in red. And of course, you can see very clearly that when you get here, near the bottom in the year 2000 and 2010, the Earth turns red. And one of the immediate consequences of the warming of the temperature is, of course, that the ice is melting. Sea level rise is the result of two major components. One is the thermic expansion of the oceans, the fact that when the, warmer is warmer, when the water is warmer, it takes more space. The other being the melting of the ice caps and of the glaciers. This graph represents the total mass of ice in the Arctic and Antarctica for every month of the year since the year 1978. Each curve represents a, uh, represents a different year. And as you can see, the melting of the polar ice sheets has accelerated recently. You 
won't need a PhD in mathematics to figure out that from the year 2016 onwards, there has been a kind of glitch in the graph. And that the total amount of ice on the planet is one of the lowest ever recorded in human history. The consequence of that is that the sea levels are rising and that some small island states in particular are now fighting for their survival. This picture was taken in the Maldives in the year 2009. It is a cabinet meeting discussing the global compact on migration. No, they're not discussing that, but that doesn't really matter. It is a cabinet meeting of the government of the Maldives, and basically that's a photo op. It was a way for them to draw the attention of the world and of the media in particular about the risk that climate change and sea level rise was posing to the re-existence of their island nation. And indeed, some of these island states, which are located just a few meters above sea level, are at risk of disappearing. Simply because if the sea level rises by one meter or two, well, basically, that's it for many of them. And it raises a whole new question, a whole new question in international law, which is about the possibility for an independent sovereign state to continue to exist even if it loses its territory. Historically speaking, there has always been a very strong linkage between the concept of a territory and the concept of a state. And the territory is typically the foundation of a state as recognized in international law and in the Montevideo criteria. If a state loses its territory, does that mean that it also loses statehood? That's a whole new question for international law. International law knows of the political disappearance of countries. Think of Czechoslovakia yesterday, maybe Belgium tomorrow. We know how to proceed in such cases. But if a state loses its territory, then it's a brand new issue for international law. And typically, states like the Maldives or Tuvalu they've come to incarnate the laboratories of climate change, the places where one could observe the very first impacts of climate change on people. And of course, one of those impacts of climate change on people is the fact that people will need to be displaced because they will lose their habitat. And our thinking and understanding of small island places as laboratories of climate change actually resonate with popular culture. In popular culture, but also in anthropology, for example, small island places have always been considered as laboratories that were fit to reproduce very primitive conditions and when, where one could observe human interactions without being polluted by other factors. This is the reason why we have TV shows like Survivor Colanta, for those of you watching TF1, where basically we put about 20 ordinary falls on an island and we observe the interactions between them. We consider the islands as laboratories of what could happen to us. And the paradox is that if small islands have taken such an important dimension in the narrative on climate change, it is because we think that they are doomed to disappear. It is in a way ironic that we became interested in places like Tuvalu, Kiribati, or the Marshall Islands simply because we were told that they could disappear. A perfect illustration of this is this giant globe that was placed in the conference hall of COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009 when delegates to this major climate conference were entering the hall, they would face this giant globe and somehow a printing glitch had made that small island states did not appear on the map. 
as if they had been engulfed by sea level rise already. So some people had to handwrite the name on the map, but in a way, the conference was already acknowledging that it would fail to save them. I find it a terrible picture. The problem of our focus on small island states in our conceptualization of the impacts of climate change on people is that we often forget that the scale of migration and displacement related to climate change is much, much, much bigger than that. And as a matter of fact, it's not just because of climate change. Historically speaking, environmental conditions have always been a key driver of the distribution of the population on the planet. If you think about it, in prehistorical times, Europe was settled by Homo sapiens because Europe enjoyed a favorable climate and abundant natural resources. The reason why so many people today live on coasts and in deltas is primarily because the soil is more fertile on the coast and in deltas. So environmental conditions have long been a pull factor of people drawing people to some places, and they continue to be in many regards, but over time, they've also become a push factor, drawing people away from other places. What you see on the screen is an engraving depicting the ruins of the city of Lisbon after the massive earthquake that completely destroyed it on November the 1st, 1755. And you can see very clearly in the foreground a refugee camp. The people from the city were displaced for months before they could return to the city, before the city was rebuilt. They were displaced by a natural disaster, by a major quake that induced a tsunami, which itself induced a massive fire. Quite a disaster. <laughs> Another historical example of people displaced as a result of environmental disruption is being told in The Grapes of Ras, one of the masterpieces of American literature, where Steinbeck tells the story of the Joad family, a family of farmers in the center of the US who, like thousands of other farmers from Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas, had to relocate to California because of a massive drought that was affecting the US at that time, a drought called the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl exodus played a very significant role in the shaping of the American nation. The reason why California today is the wealthiest and most populated of all US states has a lot to do with the Dust Bowl exodus. And at that time, in the 1930s, all of those farmers from Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas were not welcome at all in California. California didn't want them. Actually, the Senate of California even passed a law that forbade poor people to settle in California. It took the Supreme Court of the United States to overthrow that law, but it says a lot about how these migrants, albeit they were Americans, were unwelcome in California. Obviously, the Migration patterns of the two historical examples I've just described, the Lisbon earthquake and the, Disbol and the Dust Bowl exodus, have little to do with each other. In one case, people were able to return home after a few months. In the other, the people were permanently displaced. In one case, the people had to evacuate in rush. In the other, they could somewhat prepare and organize their migration. They have one common characteristic, though, and this characteristic is that both migration flows were related to an environmental disruption. And somewhat, we've completely forgotten about the fact that environmental disruptions could be a key driver of migration. Despite the historical significance of migration flows related to environmental changes, 
we've completely forgotten about that. And we've imagined that people were displaced either for political reasons, because they were fleeing war and violence and persecution, or because of economic reasons, and in which case they were migrating to get a better salary and a better life. And we've made a very clear distinction between the political refugees and the economic migrants, as if the former were the good ones and the latter the bad ones that you could send home. Not only is this distinction not valid from an empirical viewpoint, but it is also called into question by the fact that an increasing number of people are being displaced worldwide for environmental reasons. And of course, a lot of these environmental reasons have to do with climate change. Typically, we distinguish between three key impacts of climate change that have an impact on migration. These are sea level rise, extreme weather events, and land degradation and desertification. Let me start with sea level rise. Typically, when we think of sea level rise, we think of a very distant and creeping phenomenon. We think of small island states which might disappear. We do not realize that this is already a very pressing concern for a lot of places on Earth. I just want to show you this satellite picture, which was taken in the year 2002 near Cotonou in Benin. And you see very clearly the coastline in red. Here is the same picture two years later in 2004. Same picture in 2011. Same picture in 2013. It, look, it took less than 10 years for a country like Benin to lose that amount of land because of sea level rise and coastal erosion. And of course, in anticipation of future sea level rise, the government of Benin also destroyed some additional neighborhood in order to make sure that people wouldn't be affected by sea level rise. We're not only discussing about a threat that might happen in a distant future in remote places. We're discussing about something that is already affecting the lives of millions, and potentially not just in Africa. This map shows you what Belgium and the Netherlands would look like with a one meter of sea level rise or two meters of sea level rise. Today, most scientists reckon that the sea level rise by the end of the century will be comprised between one meter and two meters. You can see that this would mean quite a lot of trouble for a city like Bruges or for the city of Bar de Wever. And I'm not even talking about the Netherlands. So this is to say that adaptation measures and protection measures have to be taken right now if we are to prepare against those sea level rise. One meter sea level rise, that is what happened in the light blue on the map, this will happen for sure by the end of the century. Two meter, this is what could happen if we don't achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement, which is exactly what we're doing right now. And of course, once those people are being displaced, there is no turning back the sea level will not decrease and actually will continue to increase for quite a few centuries after the end of the 21st one. Another major impact of climate change that also displaces people, these are the extreme weather events related to climatic conditions. 
And by that, we mean the natural disasters that have to do with floods, droughts, or hurricanes. Every year on average, <coughs> it's about 26 million people who are being displaced as a result of disasters. By way of comparison, one recounts that every year, people displaced by war and violence amount to about 9 million. Which means that on a yearly basis, about three times more people are being displaced as a result of disasters than as a result of war and violence. Not to say that we shouldn't care for people displaced by war and violence, but obviously we should also care for these 26 million people on average. And most of these displacements have to do with disasters that are weather related, meaning disasters that will be made worse, much, much worse, as a result of climate change. And then, as I told you, there is a third category of climate impacts, which is also displacing people, and this is land degradation and desertification. And it affects primarily people who live of subsistence agriculture, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Sub-Saharan Africa, about half of the population depends on subsistence agriculture for one's livelihoods. Which means that every time there is a single variation of rainfall or of temperature, it means that it directly affects the agricultural yielding and therefore the primary source of income of about half of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa. And very often, the migration to Europe is the continuation of an internal migration, which often has to do with the fact that families can no longer make a living out of agriculture. Here is a picture of a guy, a lucky guy, who made it to Spain a few months ago. The Spanish police found him hidden in the engine of a car. He made it alive, and he wasn't hurt. He is one of those economic migrants, as we call them, who arrive in Europe on a weekly basis. We call them economic migrants because we consider that they've made it to Europe to make a better life for themselves and their families. Many of them, whether they come from Western Africa or the Horn, actually have left because their families could no longer make an income out of agriculture. We call them economic migrants so that it gives us a good excuse to send them back home we could have called them environmental or climate change migrants as well. It is basically us who made such a strong distinction between the environmental drivers and the economic drivers of migration. For a lot of the people on the planet, this distinction does not exist. Because the environment and the economy basically make the same th mean the same thing. For you and me, I'm sure that the amount of money that you have on your bank account at the end of the month does not depend on the weather from the past months. But for most people on this planet, the amount of money, the amount of economic resources that are available to them depends directly on climatic conditions. The environment and the economy are the same thing. which really should lead us to question whether or not it is actually possible to classify people, to categorize people on the basis of the motive of their migration. What we find out in our studies is that those migration motives are actually intertwined with each other and are mutually influencing each other and that it's impossible to separate the environmental drivers of migration from the economic or political drivers of migration. 
Yet climate refugees, as we often call them, have become the face, the human face of global warming, the human incarnation of global warming, at the same time the first witnesses and the first victims of climate change. They don't always see themselves this way. Many of them would describe themselves as resourceful agents who are not victims, but in a way agents and survivors who adapt to climate change. And of course, the idea that all migration is multi-causal and caused by a variety of factors doesn't really get along with the rhetoric that would really single out climate refugees as the expiatory victims of climate change. Yet, when we discuss them in public discourses and public debates, this is very often the role and the identity that we assign to them. <clears throat> and today, in public debates, they're often perceived as the next wave of migration, which would be completely out of control. And indeed, there are reasons to worry. Not just because, as I said, quite a lot of people are being displaced today as a result of climate impacts, but of course, there could be many, many more in the future, especially if we do not meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. If we fail to keep temperature under control and under two degrees of warming by the end of the century, if we continue on the same track, which is basically leading us to a, to a global warming of about four degrees Celsius by the end of the century, then it means two major things for migration and displacement. First, it means that some places of the world are likely to become literally uninhabitable. Today, we live pretty much in every region of the world, but if we are to go for a four degree temperature increase, we need to realize that four degrees, that's only an average. Meaning that the increase in quite many places of the world will be much, much, much bigger, of about six, seven or eight degrees. Meaning that the temperature will literally become unbearable in some places of the world, that some others will be permanently inundated, and that in others, agriculture will become simply impossible. If that were to be the case, then it means that we would need to relocate millions of people who live in regions that will become uninhabitable, unfit for human life. The good news is that we have some experience of that in Europe. In the past few years, we've been confronted to the crisis of the Syrian refugees who were fleeing a desperate situation in Syria. We've had to relocate a few hundred thousand of those refugees in Europe, and we saw clearly that it didn't lead to any issue or to any tension, that it was perfectly organized, <laughs> that Europe really rose up to the challenge, that there was a sense of unity, solidarity, and cooperation between member states, and that in a matter of a few days, these thousands of people were perfectly relocated in the different countries of the European Union. And I think this positive experience of our great ability to relocate thousands of people in a desperate situation should fill us with optimism and enthusiasm at the prospect of having to discuss the relocation of millions of people on a worldwide scale if we were to go on the path of a four degree warming. The other major consequence that a four degree warming would have for migration and displacement is the fact that some tipping points could be reached. A tipping point in a, is a threshold in the climate system when basically the climate will move and switch very quickly from one state to another irreversibly.
for example, some sea currents like the Gulf Stream could be affected. And without the Gulf Stream, the temperature in Europe or in the US and Canada would be much, much colder than it usually is. One of the reasons why two degrees was chosen as the objective at COP21 is because scientists could almost guarantee that below two degrees, these tipping points would not be reached. But of course, what they're saying is that also that beyond two degrees, then there is some probability that we might reach one or several of those tipping points. And at the moment, the tipping point that scares the hell out of scientists is the possibility that the ice sheet of Greenland might melt completely. If Greenland were to melt completely, then it is estimated that the sea level rise would not be of one or two meters, but would be of about six meters. Europe would look like this. Brussels would become a very nice beach resort. We would visit Venice in a submarine. And the crisis in Crimea would find an immediate solution. <laughs> of course, it would mean a bit of trouble for countries like the Netherlands or Copenhagen, or, the, or Denmark, sorry. But obviously, this will not happen. Not because the ice sheets of Greenland will never melt, but because European governments are already taking the measures to beef up their defense against sea level rise and to protect their territory. The government of the Netherlands is investing millions of euros every year in reinforcing the sea defense. You know that the municipality of Venice is doing the same. The Thames barrier in London is currently being strengthened. Governments are already taking measures to avoid this. The big issue would be, of course, in South and Southeast Asia. There are more people living on this map than anywhere else in the world. This is where the majority of the world population live. And as you can see, entire countries would be completely wiped out. That's the case of Bangladesh. Look at what would happen to countries like the Philippines, or Indonesia, or Cambodia, or Thailand. Look at what would happen to the area <coughs> comprised between Beijing and Shanghai. Those are some of the most densely populated areas in the world. And for those governments, adaptation means a completely different thing. For them, adaptation doesn't mean beefing up the sea defense and the dikes and dams. It means relocating people. Already today, the Vietnamese government is implementing a program called Living with Floods, which is about the relocation of dozens of villages located in the delta of the Mekong onto the hills. Because the government of Vietnam knows very well that whatever they do, the delta of the Mekong will be gone in a few decades. Even in the most optimistic scenario, that is, if all governments at COP24 in Katowice at the moment would take stronger commitments to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, if all governments agreed to divide the greenhouse gas emissions in two by the middle of the century, if we were to respect the objectives of the Paris Agreement, meaning if we were to limit sea level rise to one meter on average, then still it would mean that a country like Vietnam would lose about 25,000 square kilometers. 25,000 square kilometers, that's about 10% of the territory of Vietnam. And given that Vietnam is basically a very long coast, the government of Vietnam will not be able to build up a dike all along the coast. So they will need to choose between the populations that they will protect in situ 
and the populations that they will relocate. And that's not going to be an easy choice to make. And it will not be easy for a country to accept that you're about to lose 10% of your territory because of the greenhouse gas emissions of other countries. Pretty much every war in the history of the world has been fought for matters of territory. Whether it was about conquering new territory or defending new territory, territory has always played a central role in the history of the big wars of the world. <clears throat> so the question, of course, is what are we doing about that? I will not even discuss what we're not doing about our greenhouse gas emissions. I will not even dignify that with some minutes of my speaking time. I will discuss what is being done at the moment to address those displacements and migration. Initially, the plan was to work with international law and to create some kind of new visas or new status for the people displaced by environmental changes. We realized, however, that this was not enough, and in a way we've come past that in many regards. What we've done is first that we've considered that migration could also be a way for people to adapt to environmental changes. And actually, when you look at the patterns of migration, one can see and one can observe that very often migration is used as an adaptation strategy and therefore does not signal a failure to adapt, but a strategy to adapt. And the international negotiations on climate change have recognized this in 2010 in Cancun, and they've acknowledged that migration could be an adaptation strategy and therefore should be facilitated, enabled, and even funded. The Cancun Framework for Adaptation lists all adaptation measures that can be funded <coughs> through the climate change instruments. And they've recognized that measures related to displacement, migration, and planned relocation could be funded as adaptation strategies and should be facilitated. So that's one thing that has been done in the climate negotiations. We recognized that migration was actually to be encouraged and facilitated. Go tell that to Theo Franken and it will pull out Belgium from the Paris Agreement. A second policy initiative is the Nansen Initiative. Given that it seemed difficult to create a new treaty or a new convention to protect the rights of the people displaced by environmental changes, the government of Norway and Switzerland decided in the year 2012 to launch a new intergovernmental process called the Nansen Initiative. They consulted a lot of governments, a lot of civil society organizations, and they've kind of built a catalog of good practices and recommendations in order to foster the protection of the rights of people displaced by environmental changes. This catalog has been called the Nansen Protection Agenda, and in October 2015, 110 governments have actually adopted this non-binding multilateral agreement on migration called the Nansen Protection Agenda. Belgium was one of them. If that agreement had been signed in 2017 or 2018, rather than 2015, I'm not sure that Belgium would have adopted it. So, governments have now a series of recommendations and guidelines that they're supposed to implement. And then, there is a third policy instrument that has been developed in recent years, 
and is the Global Compact on Migration. In the Global Compact on Migration, there is a big section on climate change and about the need to reduce the impacts of climate change so that the people are not forced out of the territories of their habitat. I was myself auditioned at the UN in May 2017 as part of a very large consultation process that led to a successful conclusion of the negotiations in July of this year. And this Global Compact on Migration is a very important text because it really encompasses all drivers of migration and for the first time considers that international cooperation is the way to go to better organize migration flows and to protect the migrants. And at that time, when I was auditioned at the UN, Belgium was one of the key actors of the negotiations. And Belgium was pushing for a successful negotiation. And Belgium would even have liked that this would become a regular process like the climate negotiations, that there would be a COP every year and that every year we would build that international cooperation on migration. This is a key instrument to better protect and assist the people displaced by climate change. But NVR has decided otherwise. This picture is from the campaign that they attempted to run today. They had to withdraw it in an emergency after most people, including their partners in the government, found it absolutely horrendous. Basically, it says like this, that the UN Migration Compact means focusing and protecting and putting first the culture of the migrants before the culture of the people in the country of destination. For some reason, this global compact on migration has become the key subject of tension, not just in Belgium, not just in Belgium, but also in many other European countries. Tomorrow morning, our government might fall because of this, because of a text that is supposed, amongst other things, to better care and assist the people displaced as a result of climate change. And I think that this should be put in context. And the context is that very often, the figure of the climate refugees has been used as a way to convince governments and people that they should better reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The picture you see on the screen represents a huge refugee camp around Buckingham Palace. Of course, it's not a real picture. It's a Photoshop picture, which was part of an exhibition called London Futures, presented at the Museum of London in 2011. And that exhibition was about showing the visitors what their city could look like in 50 or 60 years under the influence of climate change. And of course, one of the pictures represented London invaded by scores of refugees. Another one represented Trafalgar Square transformed into a shanty town for migrants from Bangladesh. And of course, they meant well. The goal of the exhibition was to convince people to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and to draw their attention to the dramatic consequences of climate change on populations. But if you take these pictures out of their context, out of the exhibition on climate change, you realize that they fuel xenophobic prejudices and that they could be part of the propaganda of the British National Party or of the Brexit campaigners. What is really the difference between the pictures that I've just shown you and this poster of the Brexit campaign? We also shown a massive refugee flow taken out of context. The result of all of this, the result of our constantly presenting migration as a crisis, of our constantly presenting migration not as a structural phenomenon and a structural transformation of our societies, but rather as a problem to solve or as a crisis to manage, has been that the debate on migration in our societies, and in Belgium in particular, 
has been incredibly tensed over the past decades. The result is that migration policies and border policies have been tightened significantly. That we've built an incredible number of walls and barriers at the borders. The total length of border walls and barriers now amounts to more than 40,000 kilometers, that is, more than the circumference of the Earth. As a matter of fact, we've never built so many walls at the border than since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Next year, we'll celebrate the 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall. We'll celebrate the 30th anniversary of the moment when we all said that never again we would build wall to separate people from one another. We have done exactly the opposite. And there is something really strange to consider that increasingly we are dependent on one another for issues like climate change, for, issue like, for issues like global migration. And we seem to consider that we would better deal with these issues on our own without international cooperation. The good news, however, is that a lot of people are now considering that climate change is not just an environmental issue. It's not just an issue that should be left to technicians and specialists and experts and scientists and high-level panels and committees. But that climate change is a real political and economic issue. That should be a key marker of collective choices. And one of the reasons why so many people took to the streets of Brussels last Sunday to demand stronger action on climate change is because they knew very well that this was not just a technical and environmental issue, but that this was a matter of collective choice and that they needed to act on climate change not just as consumers, but also as citizens. And I think that if an increasing number of people consider climate change not just as an environmental issue, but as a political issue that has impacts on migration, but also on security, on development, on health, and so many other issues that are considered as the key issues of the 21st century, then finally, there is some hope that we can address it globally. And this is the reason why this very moment, I would even dare to say why this very evening or tomorrow morning is a moment of truth for our country and is about in which camp we will place ourselves. It all relates to the question of the Anthropocene. What the Anthropocene means for us is that we're all in this together. And both climate change and global migration ask ourselves the same question, which is a moral question and a moral issue. How do we consider the other? How do we consider the one who's located beyond our border? Do we consider the other as a foreigner, or do we consider the other as one part of ourselves? In other words, do we consider ourselves as first, as citizens of the Earth, or do we consider ourselves first as citizens of a country? And that is really the key question that the Anthropocene is asking us, and we're about to answer it. Thank you.